Hey friends, we have something special for you today. We have our first interview on Closer to Jesus and with our friend Christina Munoz. And she is here and she's going to talk to us about her testimony. Have you ever wondered maybe, well, what can I say to someone who's not following Jesus? Or perhaps you've gone through something really tough and you're looking for the Lord in that space. Well, Christina's here and she's going to share her story. And we're going to hear about how Jesus drew near to her in all the seasons of her life. Hello, my name is Ashley Enos, and this is the Closer to Jesus podcast. I'm here to help you deepen your personal walk with the Lord. Living a close, spirit-filled life is the difference maker when it comes to finding peace, overcoming obstacles, and ministering to others. Together, we will see Jesus fulfill his promise in James 4, 8, which says, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. All right, so we're here with our friend Christina, and Christina, we're so glad to have you. Thank you. It's great to be here. I'm excited. Well, and we're excited to have you. Now, you have a podcast, too. Yes. And it's called Every Word 365. Yes. Okay, you want to talk to us about that? Okay, sure. So Every Word 365, we literally read every word of the Bible in 365 days. (laughs) And this is something that I have done, uh, I think this is my 10th time, maybe it's my ninth time, I forget, but... I read through the entire Bible in 2010. I am I am the epitome of a journalist. I, at that time, said uh, I was a believer, and our faith is based on one book, and I've never read it, and that bothers me. <laughs> and my Bible study leader said, okay, and she got this Daily Walk Bible, mm-hmm. and we went through the entire Bible, and it was so life-changing for me. I wanted to share it with others. So I started growing it, and I would just do little groups at a time in a different church that I was at. And then someone suggested I just put it on Facebook. And I laugh. I kind of make fun of Facebook. You know, I use it for marketing. And yeah. and I put it out there. And that first year, 273 people signed up. That was in 2017. I committed to doing it every other year. And then in 2021, uh, 1,200 people signed up. And then this past year, 1,500 people signed up. And when I was asking them, I was like, well, maybe I should publish a book. Maybe I should. I send an email every day to go along with the readings. Mm -hmm. And somebody, I asked her, maybe I should do a podcast. And they all went, podcast. That's what they want. (laughs) It was like a little lunch group that we was meeting. And I was like, okay. And so I went and got a sponsor. I'm very thankful for our Travel with Friends Mm -hmm. and Arkansas Filter uh, partnered with me, sponsored the podcast. And every day for 365 days, I started October 1st of 2023. So we're almost at that year mark of doing a podcast every day because that's when we start the New Testament. So if anyone wants to join, October 1st is New Testament. Woo, it's hard yeah. to get through the Old Testament. So <laughs> yeah. we're, we're very excited. We're cheering that. And then, of course, every January, we start from the beginning of the Bible. Okay. So you start over every year. You yes. do it again. Oh. Yes. I was going to do every other year because mm-hmm. The end, it's really hard to go through Revelation during Christmas. That's hard already. And then I was always putting in all the new emails of the new group while we were finishing the previous group, and back-to-back was so hard. I was like, okay, I'm just going to do it every other year. And then I started to hear from people that do it every year, and they said, when you don't do it, I don't read my Bible. And I couldn't handle that. I was like, okay, well, I've got to do it every year then. I just felt God calling me to do it, and I said, okay, here we go. And so I do a new group. Every single year, and a lot of people do it every year, and then sometimes they get others to do it with them, and then the podcast just kind of goes along with the reading. There's a Facebook group. You get your emails. We try to encourage each other because it is not easy. I'm not pretending it's easy. Mm-hmm. It's just something that I feel passionate about. Yeah. So you're in the public eye, and you have been for a little while. <laughs> yes. For those who don't know you, uh, maybe just out side of, because we have some international listeners, okay. which is kind of cool. So talk to them about your your work history. And what I'm interested in is how, when you stepped out in faith, talking about faith, and you already had that audience, what was that transition like for you? Gosh, it was so different because I was a television news broadcaster uh, for 11 years, originally from South Dakota, went to school in Minnesota, was actually in professional performing before I went into broadcasting. Um, I did a show that my first professional show was Can Can. We counted one time. We did 98 kicks a show, eight shows a week, <laughs> 302 performances of the same show. And I went, I don't want to do this the rest of my life. So I switched from musical theater to broadcast journalism, reported in Duluth, Minnesota for a year, and moved to Little Rock, Arkansas to take a job at KATV, the ABC affiliate. Uh, moved up into anchoring and thought I would have done it the rest of my life. Loved it. 
And when we, we decided to have babies, um, it was it was really worked well because I was home in the mornings. I didn't go to work till one thirty. They were I felt like a stay at home mom in the mornings. I would go to work. Uh, they took naps in the afternoon. I came home after the six o'clock, put them to bed. And when I went back to do the 10, they were sleeping. And so it worked well. When my five year old was going to school, if she's gone eight to three and I'm gone one thirty to ten thirty, I'm never going to see these kids. Mm-hmm. And it broke my heart. I couldn't do it. I started praying and praying and praying. What what do I need to do? Um, when I left, I went to the University of Central Arkansas and marketing, PR, public relations, and very, very thankful for that opportunity. However, I ended up working an average of 73 hours a week. Oh, goodness. And I still wasn't seeing my kids, so it kind of defeated the purpose. So when I left there after four and a half years, started my own PR marketing firm, and that's when the Bible study was really starting to pick up. I had always done it on the side, but it was starting to really grow at that point. And it's so funny now because my youngest was two when I left the news, and it never crossed my mind to tell her what I used to do. She had no idea. My five-year-old remembers, who's now 15, and she one time said, Mom, why do people know you at the grocery store? (laughs) So I had to explain, okay, so used to be on TV. That's why. Well, now we've just noticed a shift. I get recognized more now for the Bible study than I do for being on news 10 years ago. Oh, that's cool. And the kids get so excited because they know that means a lot to me. So it was a major shift. But when you feel called, you just kind of, you got to obey. That act of obedience. And (laughs) it was a door maybe you wouldn't have seen five years earlier, even a year earlier. How Mm -hmm. did you recognize God was calling you to do that? What did that look like? You know, it really was a slow process. So when I was so moved by reading through the Bible, every single word, you know, it's funny how it was all new to me. I was a a baby believer. I was 25 when I gave my life to Christ. And so everything seems new and exciting, and I think that's part of why I could barely tell you the Christmas story or the Easter story, let alone the Old Testament stories. So it was new, it was exciting, and I think I assumed everybody would feel that way, which is not the case. And the first friend that I had that came to me and said, I have kids your age, similar age to your kids, they're going to ask me someday about this God, church stuff, I need some help. Mm -hmm. I said, why don't we read through the Bible? Because I had just done that. So just one friend, me and her go through the entire Bible, beginning to end. Uh, And to be honest, there wasn't the same outcome. Um, I I presented the gospel at the end, and it wasn't accepted. It wasn't the same response. And I felt very defeated in that and and very questioning in that. And it was so God and so the Holy Spirit, don't give up, keep going, try again. Mm -hmm. And so I was still at Channel 7 at the time. I invited the Channel 7 girls that I had worked with, my coworkers. And it's so funny. There were some that I thought would say yes and some that I was kind of hoping didn't. <laughs> and yeah. that's not the way it went. This group here was like, yeah, they yeah. did it. And we would meet, yeah. try to meet once a week. And let me tell you, these girls, I had no idea what was going on in their lives. And they needed Jesus like nobody else. And here we were in this Bible study together. That's what started the, we only met once a week, but we're reading every day. So I would send emails. What did you think of the reading today? What, what would you think of this? And they would interact and we'd go back and forth. That's what started the content. And then when I moved into a new city with a new job and went to a new church, I presented it there, and I was teaching in the Sunday school class. And these odds are so interesting to me because I'm a numbers person. Forty-two people in person signed up to do it with me that year, and seven completed. And that I have found, as we now have you know, dozens and hundreds, it's about the same percentage every year. That sounds discouraging, but it's actually, look at those, that many people probably read more of the Bible than they ever had. Even if they didn't complete it, they're still reading a lot of it. And for the seven that did it, it was so encouraging to hear them say, this was life-changing for me. This was exciting for me. And it really helped me decide to continue doing it. But after that one, I felt kind of like, okay, that's done. I did my part. I'm good. And one person, this is so important of the ask, one person said, hey, are you going to do that again? Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't think so. I was being very disobedient. I was going, (laughs) nah, I'm good. I think it's run its course. She said, I would do it again, and I think you should put it online. She was the one that suggested it, Mm -hmm. and I did, and that's when 273 people signed up. So just that reminder of obedience sometimes comes through other people, that they can be encouraging. They can be a part of that story. And she encouraged me to keep going and listen. And when I listened, it was so clear that that's what I was supposed to do. Oh, that's so good. Don't you find that God often will send one person to represent a much larger percentage of people? And if you will pay attention to that one person, then you're reaching people that you have no idea you're going to reach. Absolutely. And 
you may not respond to that person and he may send another and another yeah. and another. It, it, we don't, yeah. there's no way to know who and when something will finally click. Oh, yeah. He's so patient with us. Oh, he's he? so patient. <laughs> <laughs> so you are a uh, mother of two beautiful children yes. and your husband. And, and have you talked to your kids about what it was like for you to come to Christ? And would you share that story with us? Of course, yes. They have heard me speak. They have heard me share it. It might be an eye roll for them at this point because I think they could probably tell it. Yeah. Um, but I'm very, very open with it. Um, and I do think after being in the public eye, I wasn't. Um, we had, you know, nobody knew where I was politically. Nobody knew. We were very kind of kept at because you want to be unbiased in everything you do. So I was not. Um, proud or loud about my faith or anything like that. And so it's been nice to do that now. And of course, I get to teach that to them. So as I said, born and raised in Yankton, South Dakota, if anyone's heard of it, it Tom Brokaw is from there. That's the only reason anyone may have heard of it. And uh, we went to church every Sunday. I remember going to church every Sunday, but it was very social. I always say we bring the casserole and we say hi to our friends. We do not talk about God at home. We do not pray outside of church. We do not open the Bible. It collects dust on the shelf. That was just normal. Uh, my mother was raised Catholic, but she joined my dad's church um, when she moved to South Dakota. She's from Chile in South America. He was in the Peace Corps, and that's how they met and moved. And um, so it was very strange for us. When I got into the theater industry in Minneapolis, it was very easy to walk away. For whatever reason, I was surrounded by a lot of atheists and agnostics, mm -hmm. and almost to the point where making fun of Christianity, just very anti, that was my circle, that was my people. I remember when I moved here, they all said, don't become a Jesus freak, because I was going <laughs> to the Bible Belt, yeah. and I failed miserably. <laughs> and so um, what when I moved here, I was one year out of college, I had worked in a small market, so I'm you know 24 years old, and I've been here about a year as a reporter, and I get that phone call from my dad that they had found cancer in his system. And we had all gone to Chile and he knew that whole time. They chose not to tell us. We were mad at the time. Once I became a parent, I understood yeah. they were protecting us. They didn't want us worried about him. Yeah. It's a rare cancer called bile duct. And he had gone to the hospital. So we had came, it's a 12 hour drive, 800 miles North. We all got together. And I remember him sitting us down on the floor and he said three things. And he said, um, he, at that point they had said it was at 90% of the liver and they were giving him just weeks to live. And he said he was glad it was him and none of us, as a father would do. He said he had lived a wonderful life. He was a professional violinist, and he played violin all his life, and that was his passion. And then he said he wasn't mad at God. That was weird. We, we didn't talk about God. We didn't. Uh, that, so in that moment, <clears throat> we decided to pray. I didn't know how to pray. Mm -hmm. I hadn't ever done that. My family in Chile was sending me saints. They pray to a saint of healing or a saint of that kind of thing. And I remember bargaining a lot, you know, oh, if, if you heal him, I'll do this. I'll do, I'll do anything. Yeah. And it appeared to be working at first. He went six months more and he was, and it was, the tumor had shrunk to 40% and they were going to bullseye it with radiation at that point. Well, my dad was all about quality of life. So he wanted to visit his daughter in Little Rock, Arkansas, and no cancer is going to stop him from doing that. Yeah. So they came, we had a wonderful visit. This is now June of 2005. On the way home, it's two flights and a three-hour drive to get back, and all those airports, and he was struggling to breathe. And so by the time they get to the home, mom took him straight to the hospital. He ended up being there three weeks, and we get another one of those calls where you better get up here. And so we drive the 800 miles, the 12 hours we get up there. His lung had collapsed. He was in ICU. And I remember being in his hospital room, and I said the uh, Lord's Prayer because that was the only thing I knew. When my dad taught my mom English, they started with the Lord's Prayer. I really don't know why. And even when he would be in the choir and she would be late, so she was always in the balcony, they would look at each other on the Lord's Prayer, even if they were fighting or if something was going on. So I remember saying that, and I always wish I would have said more or done more in that moment. And then he got better. He got out of ICU. The lung inflated. So here comes Monday, and I've, I've got a job. I'm 800 miles away. And my dad always said, I give you roots and wings. Go. Go go do what you love. We get in the car. We go about seven hours. I'm about an hour south of Kansas City. And they call, and I say, you better get back. And I probably missed it by about 30 seconds. Yeah. But they waited for time of death until I got there. And to say I was devastated would be an understatement. I was a daddy's girl. Nothing bad had ever really happened to me. 
And in that moment, I made a clear decision. I was never going to pray again, Mm -hmm. and I was never going to talk to God again. Mm -hmm. I was so angry. I just thought it was unfair. We go through the funeral. We come back. That's actually when the TV station offered me a contract to anchor. We stay. I went through the motions, and I look back, and it's just this dark, dark period in my life. And I lived that way for six months. Mm -hmm. And so now we're in December. It's Christmas. I love Christmas. I love Christmas carols. I love everything Christmas. And it didn't feel right. I shouldn't be doing this. It celebrates something that apparently I don't believe in. So I really shouldn't. Uh, Some very good friends at the TV station, Jason Peterson and his wife, Mary Carol Peterson, they would invited us to church. We weren't interested. Uh, Talk about the importance of an invite. Mary Carol made invitations. There was glitter, calligraphy, (laughs) and it was a production at the church that they were going to called the Bema, which is Greek for the judgment seat, Mm -hmm. a one-man pastor show. And uh, they said we would go get dessert Afterwards, so I agreed, (laughs) and we went. And um, it's about that day Jesus comes back, and and the man hadn't been praying and hadn't been doing things. Spoiler alert, it's a dream. He gets to go back and live correctly. But at the end, they had an opportunity to give your life to Christ, and they did. Mm -hmm. I didn't really know what that meant, but it was a clear feeling. I was bawling my eyes out, the guilt, all of it. And that was December 17, 2005. Yeah. Can I tell you what I see in that? Yes. Okay. I see your dad has a beautiful heart for ministry. He was in the Peace Corps, so he gave his time. He met your mother. He taught her how to read. And I see how God just answered probably every prayer he ever had through that illness in your life, that that was what pulled your faith to the top, you know. The reason I'm sure your dad now is not mad at God is because he sees that how he went through was the very catalyst to pull you into your calling. Wow. That without that, who knows, you may have trucked along for 50 years and never come to the realization I that what know. you have now. And I think God just used your dad in the best way that your dad would have ever wanted to be used, which was to pull his kids into the faith. That is so precious. I never really thought about it in those terms. Yeah. And <laughs> that's what God, he can see so far ahead of us, and his ways are so much higher than our ways. I know. And your dad was... He, I'm sure he wouldn't have written it any other way than oh, exactly how it is now. That is so precious. Yeah, Thank you for oh, that. You're so yeah, welcome. Yeah, that's really comforting. I'm like, oh, your dad was amazing. <gasps> and it took about three sentences in your testimony for, you know, the heart of who he was to come through. And for your mother, too. She relied on him for a lot. Oh, yes. Yeah. And so how is it that now where you are now and you, you know who your dad was? And you know his heart for the Lord. How do you see his heart for the Lord reflected? Even though you came from a house where we didn't really talk about it, and we didn't really pray about it, but when it came down to it, you saw your dad's faith that had been just hidden under who knows why for whatever reason, yeah. but it came to the surface. How do you see your dad in your ministry that you have now? You know what I mean? Yeah. Boy, it's it's been a journey because... Once you learn about Jesus and that the Bible says it's the only way to the Father, mm-hmm. um, people like to disagree with that. People like to throw that away because it's not comforting or, or, or nice. Um, I got very regretful that we didn't talk about it. We didn't. We did go to church, yes, but we didn't go any further than that. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I'm proof churches are wonderful that going to church isn't enough. It's not. No, and I mean, that's just one of the many things we're called to do. Um, It made me wish that we had talked about it. It made me wish I knew more about his heart. Now, I also went through a path of concern where my mentor and I went through it together that I believe with all my heart he is in heaven because, you know, you don't know. You don't know what any, even, even good godly people that look wonderful, you don't know their heart. Right. And vice versa with horrible people, you don't know their heart. Yeah. It is not for us to judge. We have no idea. Yeah. But I know without a doubt that he is in heaven. And I believe my mom will be covered. She's on hospice care with Alzheimer's dementia. Mm-hmm. And because she's unable to even make decisions or think for herself now, I believe she will be covered as well. But it's so encouraging for me to think back to what was important to my dad. And he did grow up in a faith-filled family. And I laugh because his sister married a man in Georgia, Bible belts, very Southern, and they would come and they prayed out loud in public. (laughs) And I was so embarrassed when I was a child because we did not do that. It was so different. And now knowing her faith and knowing that my dad had that faith and that trust in God to not be angry at God 
when a lot of other people do, that's their story. Um, I'm so appreciative. I had to deal with that regret and get over that regret and leave that. It all happened exactly as God wanted it to. And I had to learn that. Okay, So you went through that time when you were angry with God and a a bit of a prodigal, but the Lord turned that around for you. You got, you said you got that invitation. So my question as a mother and maybe other mothers or, or people who are praying for others, what could have someone said in that dark season of your life that would have made you go, oh, you're right. <laughs> Jesus is the way. <laughs> what would have helped you then? What can somebody do? It's so funny because I'm going to sound really negative and discouraging, and that's not who I am. But I really will answer that question with nothing yeah. because it has to be spirit led. It has to be the Holy Spirit and God. So you may do something, you may say something, but you can't just sit there and think of what it will be. You can pray about it. You can pray as an intercessory prayer for someone else. Mm -hmm. Um, But the when, the when it happens is out of our hands. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was 24, I was 25 when I gave my life to Christ. And I hope that gives hope to people out there that are waiting for maybe a wayward child or someone who hasn't yet, because I think if I can be reached, (laughs) and let me tell you, when I talk about my time in theater world in Minneapolis, I mean, when I say anti, I was spewing negative. Mm -hmm. The things like, oh, if we followed the Bible, we couldn't eat pork. Um, oh, if we followed the Bible or, or when he walked on water, he was actually frozen. Well, if you read it, there's waves and a storm. I mean, like I would believe these things and repeat them. I was about as far away as you can be. And that I hope gives people hope that when it comes to what can I say or do, obviously you have got to be praying for them, but there's really not a, a, a pathway, a book, a check mark of something that someone can do. Because it's going to be the Holy Spirit. It's going to be the way that God had it planned. My Bible study leader that started the Bible study with me, the one that's in uh, Little Rock, always felt so apologetic because she did not invite me to her Bible study that started in the fall for whatever reason. She did invite me halfway through. It was it was end of December. She said, we're starting the second semester. Well, I had given my life to Christ two weeks before, and I said, yes. <laughs> And she always was like, felt so bad she didn't ask me before. And I said, if you had asked me a few months ago, I would have laughed in your face. I was that anti and that angry. But because she asked me two weeks after I gave my life to Christ, now she didn't know that. She had no idea what I went through. She felt the Holy Spirit calling her to ask me. And that was probably very scary for her because she had asked me to go to church and I'd said no before. (laughs) And the fact that I said yes to this Bible study, she about fell over. (laughs) I I honestly said I didn't know normal people had Bible studies. I thought only nuns did that. (laughs) I didn't know it was a real thing. And this group of 11 women, we are still together today. And that was back in 2005. We still gather. We still talk via text Mm -hmm. um, and just truly life changing. So it has to be spirit led. I hope that's not discouraging. No, I think it's amazing (laughs) because you do, you get kind of frustrated because you're like, well, I've tried this and I've tried this and you are praying and you're, you're working out the best, you know, to, to enlighten somebody, but you're right. You can't, it has to be Jesus. And so many times it is somebody we could have never imagined that would open the door. And that's why it's important for us to talk to strangers and, and go out and be the gospel because we are the answer to somebody's prayer. Yep. And we don't even know who they are, but God's like, I'm going to use you. And you're the one who's going to open the door at that Bible study. Just to share. Yeah. Just called to share. Yeah. And I think you bring up another great point that you and these 11 women, in the world we live in today, we think, well, I need 3,422 friends at my <laughs> beck and call. No. <laughs> <laughs> but you're saying these 11 women have anchored me. And, and it is, what do you think? Women... In this culture we live in today, we're sort of the guinea pigs of social media is what I say. <laughs> like we don't actually know what it's doing to our brains. We're, we're like the first generation to go through this much exposure right. to people and situations. And how has maybe even that small group anchored you in such a big world? So it, it's so funny that it happened all right around that same time because the first Bible study they were doing was a Priscil- Priscilla Schreier Bible study, mm-hmm. and it was called Hearing from God. And I get the book, and I'm seriously like, I didn't even know that was a thing. I had just (laughs) shot my requests up like a uh, magic eight ball, you know? (laughs) And I want this, I want this, I want this. Hearing from God? Like, totally a foreign concept. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm digging this. Here's this journalist, and I'm I'm getting so involved and into it. And these women literally held my hand. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, figuratively and literally, were holding my hand through this process. I look back and go, they must have been like, this 25-year-old female adult knows nothing. And it had to be almost <laughs> laughable to them. And yet they just supported me, held my hand. The last um, day of that Bible study, they asked me to just get up and share a 30 seconds blurb. And Sarah literally had to hold me up. I was shaking and crying so badly. And they're like, you do the news every night. I'm like, but that's not personal. That's just reading the prompter. Mm -hmm. This was very personal. I had found a life verse that I'd never done that before. And, of course, my generation, they said, Oh, how do you find your life verse? And of course, what I do, I Google things that matter to me, which is really <laughs> <Yeah>. dangerous <laughs> no. because I start with death because that's what was my hang up. Yeah. OK, well, death in the Old Testament's got some scary stuff. Let's be honest. Yeah. So go, 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 go. Next page. Get to the New Testament. And I'm completely drawn to Second Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. I can never say it without crying, but therefore we do not lose heart for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Therefore, we focus not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. What is unseen is eternal. And I share this verse. The speaker who had flown in from somewhere, her whole piece was sharing about that verse. Uh, if uh, you want to talk about confirmation, yeah. <laughs> that yeah. went from my year verse to my life verse. Yeah. Like that is the verse that I cling to mm -hmm. um, all the time. And then, so it was 2005 when I gave my life to Christ. We buy a home. We decide to have kids. We get told we can't have kids. We go through infertility for years. We finally decide we're either going to adopt or IVF at the same time. My husband was adopted. I've got all the needles and vials that to shoot myself up with this uh, IVF treatment, and you have to take a pregnancy test before you do that. And I'm mad because I'm late for work, and it malfunctioned because it says I'm pregnant. Mm -hmm. I go buy six more, and they all say pregnant. I am literally scientifically, medically infertile, which was good news because insurance kicked in. But my body is not supposed to do that. Literally, miracle baby. Mm -hmm. I get to go through all of this with this group of Bible study friends. And we have this beautiful baby, October 18th, 2008. And two days later, uh, my friend and coworker, Ann Presley, is uh, attacked and murdered in her home. Yeah. And I have said many times that I know without a doubt I would not have survived that without my faith and without this Bible study. Mm -hmm. I could cry to them. They held me up. Um, they helped me through all of it, as awful as it was and as scary as it was. The murderer was on the loose for 36 days. We didn't know if he was going after news people. He wasn't, but we didn't know that at the yeah. time. Um, there's no way I could have survived that without a biblical community, and that was my Bible study girls. Okay, so, <laughs> yeah, so you've experienced tragedy. You just had this miracle, and doesn't that make you go, oh, I'm on the mountain. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Healthy baby. Yes. Everything was great. Yeah. And then you're a friend, and you go through this too, right? It's not just her. It, it, the community goes through. And I was, I probably lived just down the road oh, from you at that time. Oh, <laughs> yeah. crazy. Yeah. And so I remember that time too. And everybody rallied together, and everybody was concerned and afraid and hopeful that she would make it. Right. And all the emotions that you have. And so at this point, perhaps maybe you're still, you know, working through the Bible. You have these friends, but you're still, it takes years sometimes for the Lord to work yes. things out. And so maybe that disappointment with your dad has maybe just come to the top because sometimes the Lord brings things to the top. We try to stuff them down yep. and hide them. And he's like, oh, let's talk about this. Yep. But did you find that as you were coming to terms, the Lord met you with your friend, that he was also meeting you with what you went through with your dad and with your faith and this new thing that was happening in your life and this new child, and that maybe he was working all that to your good. Yes. Yeah. And when I share, I can tell people, I've done it both ways. I've done it, <laughs> the trauma, the devastation, without God, mm -hmm. and I've done it with and it is night and day. <laughs> yeah. I, you, you can't even compare it. So to go through losing my dad and feel completely alone and lost and angry and bitter and all these negative emotions that will eat you from the inside out, I promise you. And as awful as losing Anne was, mm -hmm. I had my Bible study group. Um, I had the influence of her mom who just kept saying, Jesus has got this. Jesus has got this. And I'm thinking, I'm a believer, and I'm still thinking, you're crazy. You're watching your only daughter die in front of you, and you're so outspoken about your faith in Jesus. I wasn't at the time. And I watched that, and I went, I want that. I watched my mom get mad at God and mad at my dad for leaving and, and this bitterness. Uh, and she's now on hospice care with Alzheimer's dementia. 
And although Anne's mom struggled and was so devastated, she never, ever wavered in her faith. Mm -hmm. And I got to see these examples and go, I want this. I don't know exactly how. Um, It's a journey for sure, but it was so educational to me. And to have God, to be able to cry to Christ, to fall on Jesus when you're going through this. I didn't have that with my dad. I mean, so talk about a learning experience. I can just look at people and say, I've done it both ways, and I can tell you which one is better. Yeah, and what a gift your dad has left you. Oh, my gosh. Ministry, what a gift to have a testimony to say, I know what it's like. I know what you're going through, but I can tell you a different way, and that is what we're called to do. And I feel so sorry. Like every funeral I go to, for a non-believer to sit there and think, that's the end? That's it? And as you get older, you go to more funerals? Like, I can't even, I, it, it makes me so sad. I mean, that's why I want to scream it from the rooftops. There's a better way. Yes. Just just let me share. Let me, just trust me. I've got something for you. Yeah. And I can't make you do it, but I just want to plant a seed and share it with you. Yeah, and that's all we can do is plant yeah. seeds. We're farmers. We go around yes. planting seeds yes. and let God do what he wants to do. Um, and so your dad has left you a beautiful legacy. And do you feel like you have sort of taken his place in relationship with your mom it seemed like he really took care of your mom. And now you, as the faith-filled woman of God who prays for her, have stepped into that role that he has given you. He left it for you. And um, do you find, I don't know, a purpose in that? Like- oh, very much so. I, and I never really thought about it in those terms. But when she was first mourning the loss of my dad and she was still working and she kept busy and she would always say, you know, the hardest part is 10.30 at night when you say, how was your day? How it, It's so lonely to be alone in that moment. Well, my newscast would end at 10.32, and I would post on the website, and then I would get in my car, and I called her every night for the next nine years. Now I go to bed earlier than that. But for, <laughs> for those nine years, and it was just, hey, Mom, how was your day? Mm-hmm. Because she didn't have that from my dad. Mm-hmm. And it became our little connection. They were short. There weren't long phone calls. It was my drive home. And it really did fill that gap of where my dad was. And I didn't realize that till later, that that's Mm -hmm. kind of what I was doing. And I did it very intentionally. And I always felt bad when I stopped because I moved and had new hours is when she started to slip really and go down into dementia, Alzheimer's. And she wasn't conversing. She wasn't. She was lonely. You don't know what seeds you planted during that time that you didn't even know you planted. You know how somebody will come up to you and they'll say the exact right thing and they have no idea? Yeah. Like, you don't know what those conversations confirmed in her. I hope so, yeah. And do you think that maybe, I don't know, I've never dealt with dementia. I don't I don't want to speak, like, too personally about something I haven't dealt with. Mm. But do you think perhaps what she's going through now is actually a gift where you can take that load of responsibility off her and put it on yourself and pray for her in her stead that God gave her a space for grace Mm -hmm. and so that you can intercede while she's still here. Absolutely. Absolutely. I heard someone say recently to me that as awful as Alzheimer's dementia is, it's like getting the gift of a long goodbye. Mm -hmm. And I thought, how sweet is that? Because we only had six months with my dad and it seemed so hurried and so rushed. And mom's already been what I say, gone for four years. She's still alive, yeah. but she hasn't known us um, or what's going on for about four years. And I still go see her and I still give her her hugs. And it's interesting that she for a while lost Spanish and then for a while lost English. So the brain is just so interesting on how it functions. So we have to try one and see which one she <laughs> still has with her at that time. And that's even not really happening anymore. But um, it is very Uh, precious to be able to do that because to watch a long-term disease like this again without faith I think you could get really angry and really and I've experienced that I want my mom I want my mom back Mm -hmm. Uh, I lost my dad I don't have my mom I get frustrated I don't want anyone to think that I don't and I think I had that misconception that when I became a Christ follower everything would be hunky-dory and fine and that is not the case that's one of those things that reading through the Bible no one should think that if they've read the Bible. Right. Yeah. It says in there so many times, John 16, in this life you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I mean, these messages that why do bad things happen, it's in there all over. People ask it all the time mm-hmm. so that we can have character and wisdom and learn from it. And 
somebody saw me once right after all these things that happened and said, oh, gosh, I'm so sorry all these things that happened to you. And I said, you know, I am a better person today. I was kind of a shallow, nothing bad had ever happened to me person, and you kind of float through life. Mm -hmm. And yes, these things were devastating, but the Bible says they will give you that character and that wisdom. And I've still got a long way to go, but man, I came through all of that Mm -hmm. with so much that I learned, and that's exactly what the Bible says will happen every time. Yeah, it is. It's it's the fellowship of suffering, and that's what pulls you into Jesus because, hey, we need them. (laughs) We need them. It, you know, when you're talking about what it's like to see your mom slip away, you know, for those who are watching their their prodigal slip away, it's very similar. It's like they change. They're not who they were. And you feel like they're there, but they're not there. They're That's not so frustrating. Yes. Yeah, so maybe, um, you know, talking about being someone who, who came back really on fire for God after being sort of warm and cold and on fire, it, it seems like God's showing you that in sort of some different ways, what that's like to need to really get a hold of somebody and, yes. and and find them again. You know, what comes to mind is the first time I did a large group Bible study, so it would have been when there were that 273 in the group, uh, I'd say about four months in maybe, I had someone that sent a very angry message. Um, I want nothing to do with this God of yours and you know, we're dealing with the wrath of God in the Old Testament, and I understand it is very difficult to read. And let me tell you, I almost stopped the whole thing right then and there. I was so upset, and I was so crushed. Um, but then I would get emails from others that said they gave their life to Christ because of the Bible study. And here's the thing. I don't get any credit for having them give their life to Christ. I planted a seed. I took them to the Bible, and th- that has to be the Holy Spirit. That has to be Jesus. I cannot do that. But I also don't get the blame for the ones that are going towards Satan. Mm. And that's what made me realize I'm going to keep going, even though every year I would say I've had at least one. Yeah, And that breaks my heart. Talk about prodigal. Talk about going the other way. Someone who gets mad and says, this isn't for me. And now I have had one that did that and did come back years later. Oh, great. So it's out of my control. Like no matter whether you want them to do this or that, whether they're prodigal, whether they're not there, it is out of my control. I am called to share I am called to maybe scream it from the rooftops, whatever you feel (laughs) called to do, because it's so important and it's more important than any other decision they're ever going to make. But I don't get blame. I don't get the blame for the ones that fall away because I don't get the credit for the ones that actually give their lives to Christ. That's so good. That's (laughs) a good lesson. A lot of people will quit ministry because they feel like they've hit a roadblock or they're not doing any good or you get some negative feedback. And Don't you think that God sort of makes it a little bit challenging for you to keep going to that next level in ministry. So where do you think the next level is for you? Where do you think God's taking you? Okay, so this has been a big topic of conversation because um, (laughs) I like to call Google the devil because I was sending these emails. This is every day I send an email. This is back when there was 200, about 300. And July, so halfway through, I suddenly can't send the emails anymore. It just I'm doing too many. And I used to blind carbon copy them, and I would literally cut and paste all these emails in. It suddenly stopped working. So I'm just letting everybody know I'm sorry I'm trying. So I switched to this Google Groups because it's free. I mean, this is a, this has always been free. I've never had anything in it. I always said I wish I could just make money on this because I spend so much time and effort on it. But I got a real job. Yeah. I have a PR marketing firm. I have all these other things I'm doing. And um, the same thing happened last year. Google Group stopped working, and it wasn't very user-friendly anyway, but I was literally waking up every morning at 7 a.m. sending out this email. Physically, when I traveled, it got hard. If I didn't have signal, it got hard. And so I knew I needed to use an email service, but um, it cost money. Yeah. Well, I had a friend that covered that for one year of that service just because he believes in the Bible study. Well, that's kind of coming to an end now, and I want to keep doing this. I feel called to keep doing this. And so I almost became a nonprofit. I met with somebody, talked about it. It didn't quite feel right. That's just not me. I'm a businesswoman. I'm an entrepreneur. And I met with someone else that said, you should do a membership. Mm-hmm. And she suggested $5. I was thinking 7 because 7 is the number of completion and perfection in the Bible. And um, to switching to that model to help pay for the services that make this happen. And here's the thing. I can scholarship people. So if someone's passionate about it, they can fund somebody else. The chosen does that where, you know, someone can buy it for someone else. And we have had people that say, I can't afford the $20 Bible and someone else will always buy it for them. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have a big enough community 
to do that. And so it's a little bit different. It's very the way the world is right now. I mean, how many streaming devices do we have? $4 here, $3 here, right. $7 here. We don't even know yeah. uh, what we're doing. And so that's what I'm looking at taking it to a different level. Mm -hmm. um, it's scary. I'm going, what if nobody does it? What if I kill it? Mm -hmm. um, but I felt very spirit called through all of it, taking all of these steps, you know, continuing the podcast, continuing um, doing all of this, maybe getting an actual website, getting it all going and growing it from here. Mm -hmm. I, I leave it up to God. I have no idea. Yeah. I have no idea what that's going to look like, how that's going to go. Yeah. Um, my hope is a little buy-in will also keep people in. Um, because I go back to that 42 people signed up, seven completed, those odds have stayed about the same. But now if we have 1,200 or 1,500, you're going to have quite a few that are 100, 120, 150 that are actually going through it, mm -hmm. which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. I always want more. Mm -hmm. But even those few over here, they're reading more of the Bible probably than they ever have before. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. We're going to see how it goes. Yeah. And I'm always just trying to listen to God through all of it. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> You've got to take that next step in the Lord, and when he opens it and gives you an idea, I think that's awesome. I think yeah. you should go for it, for sure. Thank you. Because otherwise you'll feel stuck, and you'll just be— Exactly. Yeah, you know, and that won't help, you know. You get frustrated in God when you don't keep moving with him, so. It was so cute. My my now 15-year-old was 12 when I was doing the same thing. I was trying to figure out a way to monetize it just a little bit just to help— mm -hmm. And she said, Mom, you need merch, you know, because she's cool yeah. and knows the lingo. And so we started making T-shirts. So we have T-shirts that will say every word of the word or I read every word of the word. And then there's always been that hashtag every word 365. Mm -hmm. And it was really that's what started the name. I looked at a hashtag that wasn't taken. Right. And there was nobody that was using every word 365. So that's on all the T-shirts. And then when I became an actual business, I went ahead and got a DBA, a doing business as every word 365. So that's where that came from. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Well, okay. So um, is there anything that you feel maybe led to share? We're talking, our podcast is about drawing closer to Jesus and having that relationship. And it's not enough to think you have a relationship. You must actually have a relationship because there will be a day when we all stand in front of Jesus and we'll either he'll hear well done or I never knew you. Yes. And at that day, it's too late. It, there's just no second chance. So we've got to we've got to get it while the getting's good. And is there anything that you would tell someone that maybe feels like, well, I think I know the Lord, or you know, I feel pretty good about my relationship because you have you've been through cold, warm, and hot. <laughs> and Jesus says, if you're warm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Yeah. You've got to be on fire. Yes. And and he told me once, um, because I was talking to him about that verse, I was like, Lord, I don't get that verse. <laughs> How is it better to be cold? Because cold is a dead body. How is it better to be cold than warm? And he told me, he said, you should see what I can do with a dead body. And I was like, oh. Ooh, burn. <laughs> yeah, I, drop. Like, <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, you can raise the dead. Yep. Um, so maybe what would your advice be if somebody's like, I'm not sure if I'm warm or if I'm on fire or how do I get hot? What do you think? So two things that come to mind right away. One was uh, one of my biblical mentors actually worked in the newsroom with me. And I remember one time that, man, I thought he was so crazy. He said, I don't believe these things happened. I know they happened. Mm. And I was already a believer at the time. It just shows where I was a baby believer yeah. because I thought that was crazy. The journalist in me says, you can't know it. You weren't there. There's no way you can know something if you're not there. Right. Get all country. <laughs> I mean, and I remember when my faith, and I'm going to say it was five, six, maybe seven years where I had that moment of, I know this happened. Mm. I don't believe it happened. Even Satan believes in God. Right. There's no distinction there. I know Jesus died on the cross. I know that it happened exactly as it is written. And that was another one of those, I guess as being a journalist, nothing against churches or, or pastors or sermons. There's great ones out there. I didn't want to be told from someone else what to believe or how to believe. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go to the source. I'm a journalist, and yep. the source is the Bible. Mm -hmm. And I actually think I have a little bit of a following of people that aren't in church or have church hurt. Mm -hmm. or And I am not anti-church. My husband works at a church. But I just feel like... To go get it for yourself mm -hmm. and to know what's in there and what is said. And when questions come to me, I can say I feel very confident that blah, 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 whatever it is or whatever they're asking me mm -hmm. because I've read it so many times now. Do I have all the answers? Absolutely not. But I've read it so many times that it's very clear. Yeah. You don't need to translation and this and that. I mean, we can we can we can talk about things, but they mm -hmm. don't affect the gospel. They right. don't affect that main key thing. Yeah. 
um, that that really matters. And then the other thing that comes to mind was there was an atheist that when you talk about hot and cold, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Penn and Teller, uh, the one that talks, I forget which one it is, but mm-hmm. he's an atheist. But I respect him very much because he has done his research, he has looked everything up, and he has chosen not to believe. That is his prerogative. But he says, if you believe what that Christian faith teaches, I would be running like a train is about to hit all my friends because it is urgent. This is from an atheist who understands what we believe because he's read about it, and he is so Right. The world could end tomorrow. And your non-believing friends, I'm sorry, mm-hmm. won't get to celebrate in the streets of gold right. and heaven with you. And that with all the loved ones I've lost, that means so much to me. And I want to scream and yell and mm-hmm. shake my friends that aren't there like a train is coming for them. Right. And that's why I think I got so passionate. And so I don't care what anyone thinks of me. I am putting this out there because yeah. it means so much to me. That, to me, was the difference between hot and cold. Yeah, yeah. And he's a great example of cold because all it'll take is yeah. one spark of something to set him on fire. And yes. then he'll have that. He'll be like a Saul to Paul. Yes, you know, in an he, instant. Yeah, so maybe we should add him to our prayer <laughs> list. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so glad you joined us. You have such a warm, friendly, just a, a heart for the Lord that just comes out, and you're passionate about it. And the Lord... It's interesting to me to see how he's used all the phases of your life to get you exactly where you're supposed to be. And who knows what's ahead of you. And it's just really beautiful to see the Lord invest in a person and in the gospel that we carry, like the ministry that he puts in us. You know, it's so wonderful. So um, is it okay? Maybe I'll pray for you. Absolutely. 100%. Yes. Do you want to hold hands? I would love to. (laughs) In Jesus' name, Lord, I thank you for Christina. God, I thank you for the ministry that's in her. And I thank you for the upbringing that she had, that you used her parents and the faith that they had to shape and mold exactly who she's supposed to be. And Lord, that you have set her on fire for a cause. There's a reason, a purpose that she's here, that you have given her this desire to share the gospel. And so I ask that you would increase that, Lord, that you would increase and grow and that it would be an abundant harvest, Lord, that her harvest, her net would be so full that she couldn't even lift it up out of the boat. And God, that fish would just be flying everywhere. (laughs) So, Lord, I thank you for the gift of the Holy Ghost and the Spirit that drives us forward and teaches us and leads us into truth and that you would bless Christina. And God, touch your mother in, in this season of her life. Lord, give her wisdom and discernment. But, Lord, I pray you would give her dreams and visions, things that would speak to her where she's at, because, Lord, she still has breath in her body, and you can reach her. And so I thank you that uh, Christina's prayers are not going unanswered, but that you're changing things, that you're you're changing the season, Lord. There's a new season ahead, and we receive that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. You're welcome. (laughs) You're welcome. I hope you have enjoyed this week's episode, and I would love to hear what the Lord has put on your heart. I invite you to join me for a live Bible study on Facebook or YouTube every day at 5 a.m. Central. In this study, we are moving faith forward as we connect with Jesus by making Him the first thought on our mind. Visit AshleyEnos.com to find books, Bible studies, and more. And you can always find me on Facebook or YouTube.